Good evening, everybody. Glad you're here for the fifth lesson on our economic class on socialism. Uh, today's se session, we're going to be talking about Friedrich Hayek. He's a Nobel laureate in economics uh, that e examines socialism in depth. Uh, we've mentioned him a little bit in the past, but uh, for the next couple lessons, we're going to spend a lot of time evaluating his arguments in uh, this series on, on socialism, uh, because he was, was one of the main actors for time. Uh, as always, it's uh, useful to repeat his, his, uh, his famous quotation from his book, The Fatal Conceit. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. And that's kind of the, uh, the theme uh, uh, quote that we're having for this class because it's all about the, the calculation that we have to be able to run the economy. And that's what we're going to uh, examine. Recall from the last class, you know, we would had, had Mises' argument on calculation itself on the impossibility of economic calculation uh, in a socialist system. That was uh, really uh, the first broadside against this idea of socialism from a an economic point of view. People had always just kind of assumed it worked. But naturally, there were, there were responses. Economists started looking at Mises' argument. We saw that in, uh, in depth last time. Uh, we saw um, uh, Dickinson and, and Taylor, Lange, and others that had their own counter to Mises. And so, so Mises' uh, arguments had to, had to go a further level of nuance. And we saw that uh, some, some of the, uh, the individuals that were involved had had more fantastic claims. We'll, we'll get to that in our, our brief review in just a moment. But that led to some of the things that where Hayek would engage. And it, you might want to ask, OK, well, wh wh why is Hayek coming into the scene? Well, let me, let me start off by reading a quote from uh, the introduction to socialism, Ludwig von Mises' uh, um, masterpiece. Uh, recall that he, his first article on socialism was, was printed in 1920. And he subsequently made this massive tome uh, two years later much more in depth, although the substance of the argument did not really change. But listen to what Friedrich Hayek had to say about socialism, the book Socialism, that is. When socialism first appeared in 1922, its impact was profound. It gradually but fundamentally altered the outlook of many of the young idealists returning to their university studies after World War I. I know, for I was one of them. We felt that the civilization which we had grown up had collapsed. And no, you, you can imagine that, that feeling. World War I, all the destruction and everything had gone on. That's, that's what he was returning from. He felt like this had collapsed. We were determined to build a better world. And it was this desire to reconstruct society that led many of us to the study of economics. Socialism promised to fulfill our hopes for a more rational, more just world. And then came this book. Our hopes were dashed. Socialism told us that we'd been looking for improvement in the wrong direction. Hayek wasn't alone, of course. Uh, uh, there were many other brilliant economists at the time, Lionel Robbins uh, and others, uh, that likewise initially were, were attracted to socialism but found the logic that was within Mises' argument compelling. Uh, Hayek became a protege of, of Mises. He was never a direct student. Uh, but he did have association with him in Austria as one of the Austrian economists. And in fact, uh, in many ways, Hayek went on to go far greater uh, than, uh, than Mises. And indeed, he did win the Nobel Prize uh, in, in economics in, in uh, 1974. But one of the other interesting uh, things about history is that von Mises himself, after he'd made these, these arguments, uh, it was really fairly quiet in the 1930s. You might say, well, why wasn't he involved in the arguments rather than Hayek at this point? And, and, and Hayek uh, had been recruited over to the London School of Economics. This is just a historical tidbit for your information. Really to, to, to be the, the counterweight to uh, Lord Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, uh, who was over at Cambridge. And, uh, and at, during that time, he started writing and picking up these arguments because Mises was literally on the run. Uh, Mises, not only was he hated uh, for his work against socialism, uh, but he was specifically uh, highlighting both the Bolshevik uh, socialism as well as the Nazi socialism variants. And he was on the run uh, because also he was Jewish. And in the actual uh, uh, circumstance of, of Mises, he literally escaped by just a matter of hours 
uh, from uh, one of his apartment complexes before the Nazis were able to take it over. And when they did, this is a, a fun fact for you all, they seized all of his economic papers and writings and took it back to Berlin, where it was, was kept uh, throughout the war. And uh, when uh, the, the Allies captured Berlin at the end of the war, the Soviets captured that part where Mises' papers were, and they likewise hated Mises, and they took all of his papers uh, off to Moscow, where they stayed until uh, the, the uh, Soviet Union fell in 1991, at which point uh, they released them, and uh, they're up at Hillsdale now as a collection of all of Mises' papers. So, so let's just say that Mises was preoccupied for a good bit of that 30s time trying to, to get away with his skin in the midst of a, of a hostile world that was enveloping around them. But, but Hayek, his protege, picked up the mantle, and that's what we're going to hit today as we go and look at his response to some of these uh, neo-socialists who were tried to find another way uh, to, to answer Mises' complaint. So where we're going today, we're just uh, going to give you a quick uh, review of what we did last time. And then I'm going to uh, uh, give you Hayek's summary of the socialist calculation debate. Uh, Hayek wrote a, a book, uh, well, there were a series of economic lectures, but he published uh, a book in 1935, Collectivist Economic Planning, where he tried to grab a, a number of the arguments that had been made in this. And in that book, he had three articles on socialism uh, that we're summarizing here as well. And then we're also going to summarize today uh, the use of knowledge in society. It's, it's his path-breaking work. I'll, I'll obviously hit it more in a moment, but that's a big, big important article for us to consider. And then if we get time, we'll hit competition as a discovery pr procedure. So what did we talk about in last lesson? Well, recall that we had multiple reasons why people made arguments in favor of socialism, but the, pr pr the prominent one that was being addressed by the neo-socialists was this idea of the rationality of planning. A socialist did not like the, the so-called anarchy of capitalism, where there would be resources, dual resources would be applied to the one particular uh, product. I, you might have a General Motors and a Ford building the same pickup truck. Doesn't that seem like a lot of ways? Can't we do it more efficiently if we just have one? That kind of, of conflict, the, the very things that we might like in a free market system of competition leading to a better result was seen as a lot of waste, the anarchy of production. And so the rationality, rationality of planning was the argument they were trying to address. There are other arguments to call, re, recall that we talked about the inequality issues that are there are even today many aspects of uh, arguments for socialism, but that's not what was being addressed here. Their arguments were really those economic arguments about the rationality of planning. Uh, Mises' critique, uh, we talked about that the, the, the economic calculation Rash, and this is an important point, rational economic calculation is impossible. And so, so for Mises, it wasn't that you could not do economic calculation in, a se in the sense of being able to say, okay, we have X number of resources, we're going to apply it to something else in, in, in production. The question is how you would do it. What mental calculus would drive you to use one production technique over another? without the use of economic signals. That's, that's what Mises' critique was all about for them. And, and so we talked about the debate over the nature of the economic problem. Uh, you know, was it really an equilibrium problem uh, of, of where the economy is just kind of really stable and just veers off a little bit and you go back to, uh, to that equilibrium with a little minor adjustment? That would be one kind of problem. Or is it fundamentally one of disequilibrium? Uh, we, we, we saw that the market actually has, has things constantly changing. So that was part of the debate as well. Uh, this, this what we call the static analysis versus this more uh, dynamic analysis that we might have under market settings. So the market socialists that came up with their answers, they assumed a very important assumption. They assumed that central planning could have all of the same relevant knowledge that any market would have. In many cases, they would even go f further and say we could have better knowledge uh, uh, because they could uh, glean out uh, s some of the, the, the irrelevant knowledge and so forth. Uh, but, but they said, you know, we, we can obviously figure out consumer preferences, and, and we would generally agree that's not particularly hard, but they would know all of the production possibilities. They would know the costs association. You know, in, in, in economics, for instance, we often draw cost curves to show what, what a, a production company actually faces. But these are mere abstractions of what 
uh, theoretically would look like. We know conceptually there's something like that. But there is no such thing as actually a cost function uh, in, in most cases that would drive an entrepreneur. But they would just assume that that was reality and that it would be available as well. And so, so the, the we, in last class, we really talked about two different ways uh, that they could solve it. Uh, the first way, uh, Taylor and Dickinson actually suggested, you know, there are millions of simultaneous equations that we could solve mathematically to get to the solution of what should be produced, how much, and so forth. Uh, and and Lange and, uh, and Taylor all had a different method. They had this idea of a trial and error process. They said, no, we don't really need to worry about uh, millions of equations. We can just do what the market does. We can have trial and error, and if we set the price too low, uh, there will be a, a, a shortage. If we set the price too high, there will be a surplus, and we will direct the managers uh, to price their products according to uh, uh, you know, the min average total cost of production, these kind of technical terms. We could just tell them basically to play market, and that would work. Uh, so that's what the, they would, would argue was, was a possibility. And, and as we saw last time, you know, conceptually, that might solve the computation problem. But the computation problem is not the same as the calculation problem. Uh, and what, what we, we meant by that, of course, is there, you know, actually solving the problem of how many shoes to produce, how many, whatever it is, the, the finished good, is, is a trivial problem compared to knowing what to do and, and what's the best way of doing it and how many production resources ought to go into that process. When would you make a change? These are all kinds of different things. Uh, and it might be, one way to think of it might be the difference between how you would price uh, consumer goods, the final retail goods, versus how you might actually produce the, the prices of the resource inputs. And, and those are all driving factors that would be part, the latter being a part of this so-called calculation problem. Okay, and, and uh, the, the argument that uh, many of the uh, free market types would make is, is if you assume that the central planner has all of this requisite knowledge, you've assumed effectively the problem away. So that's where, where we talked about la last time. So uh, in, in the next three charts, I'm going to have three charts called Socialist Calculation 1, Socialist Calculation 2, Socialist, Socialist Calculation 3, because that's the way Hayek wrote his articles uh, to answer what, what is. So the first one, uh, Calculation 1, was really he's tried to capture the nature and history of the debate. This is a little bit repetitive, but, but at this point, considering what we just did in, in last lesson, but he's going to sum up this so far. What, what have we learned and what's his counter uh, to this? And so uh, Hayek starts off with this, this idea that part of the problem is, is that they just simply do not understand the economic problem. It's easy to improve something if you don't really understand the problem. And uh, just uh, er earlier, I was looking at this article, and I just want to highlight as, as illustrative. This is a kind of a political argument, but the, at the, the current cultural moment uh, as, as we're having this class, but it's not, it's just illustrative of this concept. So, so Mayor Bloomberg, who's candidate for president of the Democratic Party, uh, ha, ha, was, well, they found a, a speech that he made in, back in 2016. And here's what he said. He was trying to make the case, to be fair to Mayor Bloomberg, he's trying to make the case on, on how we uh, need to be educating citizens today. But he's going to say some things that are rather unfortunate that he's getting some flack for today. Here's, and I'm quoting this as, as in context. If you think about it, the agrarian society lasted 3,000 years, and we can teach processes. I can teach anybody, even people in this room, so no offense intended, to be a farmer. It's a process. You dig a hole, you put a seed in, you put your dirt on top, you add water, and up comes corn. You can learn that. Then you had 300 years in the industrial society, you put the piece of metal on a lathe, you turn the crank in the direction of the arrow, and you can have a job. And we create lots of jobs. I'm going to skip ahead to his, his main point. Now comes the information economy, and the information economy is fundamentally different because it's built around replacing people with technology. And the skill sets that you have to, to learn and how to, and are, are how to think and analyze, and that is a whole degree level different. You have to have a different skill set. You have to have a lot more gray matter. Now, I, I actually get to the bigger point he's making. Uh, in, in every aspect of our society, uh, things have gotten more complex. Uh, 
but, but it's a little bit of hubris to talk about farming that way. Of course, we have a whole series of, 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 of uh, college institutions that are, uh, came up and sprung up over the years to teach uh, agricultural methods. It's, it's actually quite complex. <laughs> it's not simply dig a hole, put a seed in, water in, up comes the corn. Uh, it's a little bit more complex than that. But, but here's, the, here's the point that I'm making. I'm not trying to really poke fun at Mayor Bloomberg. The point that I'm trying to make is when you are outside the system, it gets a lot easier to imagine that what's inside is, is pretty easy because you don't see all the real details are involved. So, so, so for Mayor Bloomberg, who's not a farmer, you know, and neither am I, that's for sure, but for, for some outsider to think that this is easy, well, you give it a try. It's, it's not quite so easy, and, and that's kind of the point. And Mayor Bloomberg is aware of how, how much more difficult the technical part of the IT world is, because that's where he made his billions. He's spent a lot of time. He knows that's a tough problem, and he's right. But what he fails to see is, of course, that these other areas uh, are equally difficult if we're going to have the, the kind of uh, improvements that we, we uh, want in those fields. And so, so how much more so in economics? Most people uh, think that they have a pretty good idea of economics. Hey, it's easy to, they just naturally assume, you know, these things are going to just happen. And so, so uh, for Hayek, he's pointing out, you're just assuming that all of this data, all of this knowledge that emerges naturally through the market process is going to be available to the central planner. And that's just not true. It's precisely the context of the institutions, the, the incentives that people face for profit and loss that lead to the generation of the knowledge necessary to be able to run a market. So the central planner is not going to necessarily have that. But you can see for those that are on the outside, they just think it's going to be available. It seems a little bit easier when you're on the outside. Um, and and that's, that's coupled by this, this other attribute or, uh, or fact, if you will, of kind of modern society. The reality is we've had tremendous, Hayek noted then and imagine our world today how much more so. We can solve practically any technical economic problem we set our mind to. And so because we've gone so far with our ability to solve problems, we assume that all of these problems can be solved away. And so that gives us this imagination. You know, uh, Elon Musk says, I'm going to go to Mars. And he may do it. <laughs> but the question of whether we can technically go to Mars doesn't necessarily mean we should go to Mars from an economic standpoint. And that's kind of something that, uh, uh, that Hayek's pointing out here. Just because you can do something technically does not mean it's economical to do so at all. Because in economics, we're always aware of this idea of trade-offs. That to do one thing is to not do something else. So to go to Mars means we can't use all of those engineers, all of those resources that are brilliant people to do something else that could have been done. Doesn't mean we shouldn't go to Mars. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, agnostic on that little point. Uh, but the point is, it doesn't mean just because you can do something, you should do something. That's a, a key point. And so Hayek's quote uh, in, in Calculation 1 is worth repeating. The economic problem of distributing a limited amount of resources between a practically infinite number of competing purposes, that co constitutes the problem of socialism as a method. Because they, ha they haven't said how they would decide of the unending possibilities of what you could do. How do you decide what you're going to do? Uh, and so, so to answer those arguments, uh, we, we see that the socialists emerged these, these kind of uh, two-pronged ways of, of, of answering this question. But in both cases, they try to, in a, in a way, play market by introducing some me measures of competition. Uh, and so, so without such, you know, quote again from Hayek, without some such central control of the means of production, Planning in the sense in which we have used the term ceases to be a problem, it becomes unthinkable. Here's, here's what Hayek is saying when he says that. You know, we've, we've, we've started down this path, and I'll hit it again in a moment, but it's, we'll point out here just a little bit. We start down this path because the neo-socialists are trying to critique the market system because of its irrationality, and they want to introduce planning. And when criticized about planning's inability to do so, what do, what's the first thing they do? Is say, well, we need to bring back some competition. Well, isn't that the irrationality you were trying to eliminate in the first place? Uh, and, and that's the sense, uh, are we having, uh, it becomes unthinkable uh, that we're having uh, the planning 
uh, that, that they're, they're using. Um, and, and so Hayek then, then contrasts this, and this is, this is worth pointing out. This is a really good uh, quote that he has in this uh, um, e episode that he has, this essay. We are certainly as far from capitalism in its pure form as we are from any system of central planning. The world of today is just interventionist chaos. Wow. How much more so today? I, uh, one of the beauties of the socialists, and, and, and indeed in this whole argument, and, and it's very important for you to understand because this is ongoing today, and not just in uh, the, the modern uh, arguments in favor of socialism, but, but it's very much there as well. It's a broader problem. Typically, whatever the status quo is, the idealists attack your position as the status quo. And, and, and the status quo reality of whatever is today has a really, really hard time competing against the utopian ideal. And so when they can criticize whatever the market looked like then and say that, hey, that is capitalism. Does this sound familiar, by the way? Uh, then they hold out a utopian system, uh, socialism, and, and there's no problems because we don't have anything, any experience to point to. So it gives you a, 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 a different problem. So, so, so it's, it's not a fair comparison, in other words. If you compare utopia to reality, guess who wins every time? <laughs> of course utopia is going to win if you believe that utopia is possible. I will say, as a Christian, you should not believe in utopian solutions. There will be a utopia one day when Jesus comes again. Until then, we're going to uh, uh, slog it out, and we're going to try to make this world a little bit better day by day as we uh, try to honor him by what we do. Uh, but that, that's a point that he's making. It was, it was thought that the, the system of the time, and we have this, the same thing going on today, is capitalism. What we have today is, is, is at least as much interventionist chaos as what, what Hayek had in his day. It certainly was not uh, uh, capitalism in a pure sense. Uh, it's also important to note that he, he says that this is, this is ongoing, this argument. Mises was making the case about uh, rational economic calculation, but he, he, he was the first in 1920, but Max Weber was right behind him. In fact, Max Weber uh, was not aware of Mises' work, book until, uh, or, or his, his article until just right before his publication, uh, and so he didn't really have time to integrate that into his, 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 his points. But Weber was, was very uh, uh, skeptical. He was worried at the time if we actually tried to implement um, uh, socialism across the world, we might have mass starvation across the whole globe. That was his concern. Uh, Boris Brutskitz uh, was a Soviet uh, economist, and he had had some of the initial experience that we talked about uh, previously in one of the other lessons uh, with the, the, the aftermath math of the Bolshevik uh, Revolution in 1970 and the massive famine that was ongoing uh, there. He also wrote about the problems of, of, of economic calculation as well. Uh, those are other arguments that are out there. Uh, now, one of the, the things that, that was perhaps unfortunate, and, and this led, to, and this is from, from Hayek's perspective, uh, to have a meaningful discussion, is, is Mises had, was thought to have said, socialism is impossible. He, of course, did not use, he did not say that. And his use of the word impossible uh, was perhaps unfortunate from Hayek's perspective. In, in this sense, uh, you know, socialism clearly was possible in the sense that it could be tried. Uh, and, and, and if it didn't kill all of the people, in some limited sense, you could say it worked, right? They had massive starvation and other things. And it, it, the, the Soviet Union kept going, and, and that was one of the chief arguments, by the way. Well, of course, socialism can't be impossible, because if it was, you know, the Soviet Union would have long been dead. And by then, it's the mid-30s, and this revolution had been going on for well over a decade, right? And, and so socialism is impossible, yet they seem to be doing okay. And this was aided in a better, by the way, by the Western uh, propagandists who kind of hid Stalin's terrors and some of the other things and always are publishing the Soviet experience in very glowing terms. Uh, the, the, if you check into the history of that, you'll find it quite amazing how much it was, it was presented in a positive way despite the, ma the millions and millions that were dying during uh, some of that time. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that's not exactly what Mises had said, of course. Mises had said simply that under socialism, rational economic calculation is impossible. And what he meant is he didn't, didn't deny that you couldn't have socialism and economic calculation. What he's denying, of course, is that you would have some rational basis to make those decisions. Without market prices, how would you know, know anything about 
uh, the, the relative scarcities of capital equipment, whether you should have more capital employed, employed in one process versus another. You can make those decisions, but Mises suggested that's going to be a purely arbitrary decision. It's not, you need something to give you real information to show you the relative scarcities related to actual uh, consumer desires to understand that you're going to be producing what the people actually want. The market does that automatically. For a central planning process, there's no rational way to do that. So that's, that's uh, one of the issues that, that Hayek raises. For socialist calculation too, uh, now he says this is a stated debate. And again, remember this is uh, 1935 where it is today. Russia, while you know, it, the rejoinder, well, uh, socialism can't be impossible because Russia's still around, Soviet Union's still around, well, th that, that might have been true in a limited sense, but it, clearly the problems were out there. It, there were some doubts about what socialism was doing. And, uh, and at this point, no longer did the, the, the socialists want to say that, hey, you know, socialism's just going to produce way, way more. And so Hayek says this is actually a rear, rear guard action to suggest at least it could be possible, it's at least conceptually possible to produce, because the obvious limitations that were happening out of the Soviet Union uh, suggested it's, it's not uh, necessarily always going to lead to that uh, socialist utopia, certainly not right away. Uh, and I, I have not been able to find a source but, uh, for this, this quote, but this is something I've heard uh, all my life earlier. Uh, there, was this, there was this idea in the Soviet Union that the propagandists uh, of the leadership were saying, we're starving to greatness. And, and, and the, the concept, whether the words were used or not, was, was basically this. Leadership of the Soviet Union uh, constantly addressed their people, yes, you're suffering privation. Yes, you don't have as much material resources as perhaps now, but we're doing this to have a much better future. That was kind of the logic of what was, was being on. But, but by now, it's 1935, you can imagine, uh, from 1917 to 1935, well, how many years do we have to starve to greatness before we stop starving? That was one of the, the, the experiences which led to more of the discussion. Uh, Hayek admitted, though, in, in, in the sense of uh, being logically uh, contradictory, Taylor and Dickinson, what they were say, saying about solving millions of equations, simultaneous equations, we'll get the mathematicians to do this, it's not impossible in a limited sense that you, it's, you could not do it. But, but for, for Hayek, the key issue is, <laughs> is it possible that this could actually be done? Is it practical? Now, now this gets to, to a real issue of contention even today amongst the kind of the free market supporters, uh, and, and you'll see why in just a second. Hayek starts to, Hayek starts to mix this computation slash calculation issue, uh, and he'll later be seen or argued as being conceding the calculation issue, but, but to give Hayek his due, I think he's actually stunned that Taylor and Dickinson think that there's some possible way you're going to have a central planning board that is going to be giving millions of equations, simultaneous equations, that they're going to be solving. And not just solving once. The market's doing this every second, right? There's millions of people doing lots of interactions. Uh, you know, you could imagine even with today's vast, vastly superior computing power and, and, and artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, yet things are going on in the imaginations of individuals in the creative minds of people in the image of God, and things are different than we expect. Uh, so Hayek's shocked that they seem to be suggesting they could do it, and he's really saying, do you realize what you're suggesting needs to be done? That's, that's ridiculous. Uh, they took that, however, as, as, well, you're conceding the argument. Now it's just a matter of, can we do it? You, Mises said it was impossible, and now you're just saying, is it, is it practicable? And so that, that became part of the issue. Uh, and and he's, he's arguing for th that this, this concentrated knowledge would have to be available to the central planners, and of course, uh, that's what he's denying could, could be there. Uh, again, he's boggled by the scope of the practical problem that, that they're suggesting. Uh, and and he, he makes a point here, and this is, I think, a really, really good one. Economists everywhere understand, and we would argue, there's very few economists that would argue uh, for the idea of price fixing. The, the price discovery, discovery is a central part of economics, how we, we, we show what relative uh, valuations of consumers are. And whenever you have a government fixed prices, and, and we've had this in America, again, this sh shows it's 
the interventionist chaos uh, comment is, is applicable here as well. So in the uh, early 1970s, for instance, President Nixon implemented price controls. And of course, why did that happen? Mass shortages. You always get with price fixing either a shortage or a surplus. The idea that you would fix the price at exactly the market price is ridiculous. It would be you know, very, uh, very unlikely that that would happen. If it were to happen that you actually were mirroring what the price system would have otherwise done, well, why would you need to fix it in the per first place? That's the whole point. Whatever the market price is, we don't like it, we're going to fix it to somewhere else. Well, that just means either the market thinks it's higher or lower, and you're going to push it the other way, and that leads to either shortages or surpluses of the goods. So, so economics is, is unanimous in this, uh, in, in, in the, the orthodoxy, that this is just really bad economics. Well, in effect, though, that we see that just come out in spades, if you will, in, uh, so, so when we have just one or two prices that might be fixed. Effectively, a central planner is going to fix every price in the economy. How much more chaotic would that be? And th this is a really important point. We can talk about whether it's impossible or, or, or impractical. It's, it's, just, uh, uh, it's just absurd, is, is, uh, in, in my estimation, that we think that we could uh, fix prices in millions and millions of goods, and, and that's not going to lead to, to problems. Hayek then introduces another question. Who's going to be the manager in this? You know, we're going to have the central planner. They're going to assign a manager, and it's, it's, it's a really important function and task. Uh, how do we know if they're, how do, first, how do we pick the right person? Is he or she the right one for the job? How are you going to evaluate them? How will your, their performance be judged? If they lose money, even if you allow money to be in the calculation process of some sort, you've got some funny money, so to speak, in socialism, uh, that how will you know that that was a bad decision? We have managers every day in businesses that lose money. And we don't necessarily fire all of them. Was that the wrong decision? Were they taking prudent risks? Everybody has expectations about the future. You may have, have had one idea, and that didn't pan out. Most, people's, m most of us, every day in our own reality, aside from the market aspect, have, have ideas about what's going to be in the future. And the future, for some, some strange reason, doesn't quite look like what we thought was going to happen. That happens in the market as well. And, and so, so if they take a risk and go down a path and it's wrong, was that the wrong answer? Well, we know that risk needs to be taken. Uh, in a market system, people are penalized precisely according, do they do this repeatedly, do they lose their capital? You can get away with losing money in a quarter, maybe two quarters. Multiple quarters, then that shows that you are not an effective steward of capital, and that capital will, your capital will be taken away and given to someone else. Uh, so so what, if they don't, what if they never lost money? Would that be a good sign under, under a socialist system? Well, it's not clear at all. Maybe there are risks that should have been taken. And these are all questions that, that have to be answered. And so uh, this is re re uh, hitting another uh, point that we just made a moment ago with one of Hayek's quotes. It's idle to ask whether such a scheme still falls under what is usually considered as socialism. On the whole, it seems, to be, it, seems it should be included under that heading. More serious is the question is whether it deserves the designation of planning. Is there any rationality uh, still there when you're reverting to some sort of uh, trial and error system uh, where we're going to play market. That's uh, something that he's, he's asking. And so if, if that was your, your whole goal in, in the first place, to get rid of irrationality of the market, uh, you've, just, you've kind of abandoned that issue yourself. Now we're up to socialist calculation three, the competitive solution. Uh, and, and so he, uh, this is where, you know, Lange's going to just pounce on Hayek's comment that, well, hey, this is, have, can you imagine the impracticability of, uh, or impossibility, if you, in, in, uh, probably not that, you use that word, but the uh, very difficult nature of solving millions of simultaneous equations, uh, Lange pounces on that. You see, you've given up the central point. Uh, socialism is possible. And so, uh, Hayek retorts, it's, it's surely unfair uh, to say because they deal with, in a new way, with new schemes evolved to meet the original criticism, have given up the essential point and retreated to a second line of defense. Is this not rather a case of covering up their own retreat by creating confusion about the issue? Here's, here's Hayek's perspective. Look, Mises is answering Marx. By, by, uh, Marx says that we, we can get rid of the irrationality of the market 
by socialism. Mises shows how that, in fact, that you're going to have this failure because you can't do rational economic calculation. And so the neo-socialists say, okay, well, we'll just play market. And then when Hayek comes on to say, well, when you're playing market, you're uh, uh, seeding uh, these whole series of events, you're answering different questions. They're talking at different levels. Uh, so so uh, in, in one sense, both sides think the other side has, has conceded the essential point. When the neo-socialists come on board and say, well, we'll just play market by trial and error or solving that, we'll do just what the capitalists did. Uh, from Hayek's perspective, they've done exactly what they're accusing him of. And when he answers them in a different way, uh, it's because they did it first. They left the original argument because Mises' argument has already crushed the Marxian argument. That's kind of the point that, that Hayek would see as he's, he's making this. And regarding trial and error, uh, I, I like this quote, so I'm throwing it up there for you to consider as well. The difference between such as systems of regimented prices and a system of prices determined by the market seems to be about the same as that between an attacking army in which every unit and every man could move only by special command and by the exact distance ordered by headquarters and an army in which every unit and every man could take advantage of every opportunity offered to them. I mean, you have this, this image. <laughs> Imagine a war. Uh, you've just been shelled. Uh, waiting for that phone call from the general. Do I attack back? Do I not? And, and, and um, you know, the, the whole per possibility of plans is every plan, you have to plan in, in the military for conflict, but as soon as the conflict happens, the plan goes in the, the trash bucket because you've got to adapt to the new situation. Uh, every, every military person really understands that. But if that's the analogy, if the central planner makes a plan for what the market should do and it looks different, what does the manager do? And, and this is an important point. In all of the socialist literature uh, up to that point, there had been no discussion at all about the time frame, how, how frequently these plans would come out. Right? Are they going to come out daily? You know, that seems, you know, remember, they're solving, according to uh, uh, Taylor and Dickinson, they're solving millions of simultaneous equations. Uh, are they coming out every day? That's a lot of, a lot of work to be done every day. Uh, but, but the market system is doing it every second because that's not what they're doing, solving, actually solving millions of equations, but they're adjusting. I, I said in a previous class, and just to, to reiterate if, if you weren't here in that class period, markets today... Uh, the best scientific literature, if you have some headline news item that comes out that's some big uh, event, and it could even be a small event, but if there's a big event, you will see markets respond within just a few seconds to price that into the stock market prices and futures contracts. Markets are already starting the process within seconds of new information. They're instantly processing. Somebody's looking at a way to make a buck and reallocate capital towards the, the, the new uh, problem that's been uh, based on the new information that's out there. So what, what would be the time period for the socialists? They don't say, is it months, is it days, is it, uh, what, what is it? If they have to wait, if they have to follow the leadership, rather than relying on the person on the scene to take advantage of the knowledge themselves to do what's rational, you're gonna have a bigger problem. Okay, uh, and, but the real world, uh, you know, it, it doesn't look like that. You can imagine if this was, you know, an equilibrium world where we just have, uh, you know, of constant data, everything's kind of the same, then trial and error might work. But that's not the world we live in where constant change is the rule, says Hayek. And then he asks the question, this is, this is a good one. We are uh, here at Cedarville being blessed uh, by the construction of a Chick-fil-A uh, scheduled to be done uh, before the fall of this year. And, and many of you are saying, praise God. I love this. I can't wait for a Chick-fil-A or a chicken sandwich. Well, good for you. But, but I can assure you that that's the one and only Chick-fil-A going on to Cedarville. <laughs> we will not have another Chick-fil-A in Cedarville. There is no trial and error for the uh, uh, pricing of what that is. That was a one-off contract. And there is much of our economy that is one-offs that are done. So how would you ever, you know, if we're treating this as all, well, if there's millions of these widgets produced and we'll, if there's too many of them, we'll just lower the price and raise. That presupposes 
you're going to have multiple opportunities to engage in, and that might work for some products, but many, many products. You know, think of a, of a naval ship that's built. I mean, every one of those is a one-off. Uh, and there's many. When you, when you go to a contractor to redo your basement, that's a one-off kind of contract. What's the trial and error if you price it too low? That it just, it's nonsensical for, for many kinds of large-scale enterprises. Uh, and uh, Hayek, and, and this is apropos for today, there's a distinction between politics and economics that breaks down once you go into socialism because now everything is, every economic decision is now political when the political system runs it, which is what happens with socialism. Uh, and we're, many of us are seeing that right now in our world around us as, as increasingly many things of, our, of what formerly was held privately is now in the public uh, debate and, and many, uh, many of us don't like that. So, so Hayek's pointing out that, that difference even back then. Uh, and the reason is because it's going to force any central plan necessarily has a series of, of a common set of values that guide it. And I'm not just talking about moral values, even just preferences, right? Somebody's pr preference, I, you remember we, we talked about uh, Bernie Sanders says we can't have 16 kinds of deodorant or something like that. I forget the exact quote uh, because he thinks we have too many when poor people don't have food. Uh, you know, and that's a value, but, but that's, that's his value, and many others, and there's others that have different values, is precisely the point. But under socialism, there will be one set of values that will be promulgated that we will all have to do. That's going to increase the kind of the conflict as, as we have underlying differences of opinion. Okay, we're now ready uh, to, to go in the use of knowledge in society, and, and uh, that was kind of the state of socialism uh, uh, for, for those mid-years through the 1930s. It was perceived by many in the economic profession that the, the market socialist won and Hayek uh, uh, had lost the debate. Mises was nowhere to be found and, and World War II was st uh, starting and other things were on their mind. Hayek kept thinking about this issue. Uh, I assigned you in the Individualism and Economic Order a few chapters, but I also encourage you to take a look at the other uh, uh, chapters in there. Hayek actually wrote several articles on uh, economics and knowledge. And so this is in the back of his mind and, and, and uh, just percolating there. When he wrote The Use of Knowledge in Society, I just want to just tell you some background just so you can appreciate how profound it is before we actually get to the substance of the article. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to get uh, published in a, a top-tier journal, but Hayek was called uh, by the editor of the QJE. This is the report I learned at grad school. I, I, I think it to be true. But he was called to contribute an article to the Quarterly Journal of Economics, one of the top-tier journals. And he wrote this article in three weeks. And, and what we have happened, this is the article that effectively won Hayek the Nobel Prize in Economics. This article is the most widely cited article in economics outside the field of economics. So non-economists have looked at this article as the, one of the most important articles that all of economics has produced, and they cite it in their own discipline on how we learn things and what kind of knowledge and how it works together. I just want to put that in perspective. And the reason he was able to do this is, is precisely because he'd been thinking about socialism for years, answering in every step of the way. You saw that a little bit in the, the, the Socialist Calculation 1, 2, and 3 articles. As, as he keeps thinking about it, it gets more and more nuanced and getting to the core of, of what's really important. And we're going to see this in the use of knowledge in society. Uh, his, he starts out this article. If we possess all the relevant information, if we start from a given system of preferences, and if we compl command complete knowledge of all available means, the problem which remains is one of purely pure logic. Here's what he means by that. If you assume all the inputs to a mathematical equation are known, it's only a matter of doing the math right to get the answer, right? Because that's this, this idea of simultaneous equations, when he says pure logic, he's saying we can solve this by math because you're assuming you have all of the inputs to the equations. But in fact, that is not the problem. He says emphatically that's not the problem which society faces. Uh, what we have, the real problem, he says, with, w w of economics, is the knowledge which is needed never exists in a concentrated form, but instead it's dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess. That knowledge is widespread amongst many people. How do you use all of that knowledge that you are assuming is available 
from a central planner. And so if you wanted to summarize the economic problem, he would say it's the utilization of knowledge which is not given to anyone in totality. And, and uh, just, he would note this later, but I'm going to bring it up now. It wasn't in this article. Very importantly, it's not just that this knowledge is not known. It's that this knowledge is going to be generated as part of the market process. As, as the competitive forces are underway, the to and fro, the haggling and the higgling in the market, the thinking about what the profit could be, that's going to generate the knowledge. This, this idea of, of, of what using the best technique, that best technique has to be discovered daily. As I, I'm the dean of a business school here at Cedarville. I tell my students every day, our management uh, majors that are going into production, they're trying to learn, how can I make a production process more efficient? They're trying to change that production function. I tell my, our marketing students, you, you're, you're trying to make sure that people want to buy your product. You're trying to shape that demand to help them uh, understand how your product could meet their needs. The idea that consumer preferences are, are given and fixed it, it, it denies what the whole market process is going to try to do. And so how would you, would you do that? So Hayek, back to Hayek's point in this article though. There's two kinds of knowledge that Hayek is, is hitting. First is this idea of scientific or technical knowledge versus that we will call it circumstantial, what Hayek calls the knowledge of time and place. And so when we think about this, uh, this, this, uh, this idea of scientific technology, let me summarize that. You could think of it uh, maybe if, if the world, if the economy were all like a nuclear power plant. You know, you can imagine an idea where if, if everything's a very, uh, very highly specialized technical problem, then that kind of knowledge might be very much important. But the, the knowledge of time and place is the knowledge of, of what's going on at, at the, the person on the, the spot that sees something, that sees a profit opportunity and so forth. Uh, you know, we have this idea that, that there's this continuous flow of information and if it just requires minor uh, uh, adjustments, then uh, you're, you're okay. But economic uh, uh, problems always and everywhere arise precisely due to change. Things are dynamic. It gets back to that dynamic con concept we talked about earlier. And, and the, that kind of knowledge, those, those things that are happening on the spot in the field, they can't be aggregated for use by central planners. Remember, there's millions and millions of market participants. They all have their individual pieces of knowledge, fragmentary, sometimes contradictory. How do you add up those pieces to get to the right answer? The very act of aggregation is going to obscure those, those little details that are what each individual possesses. And, and so it's impossible to use that kind of knowledge. Uh, so that begs another question. If that's more the, what the world looks like, not maybe the more this, if the economy is not really just like this highly technical process where a, pan, a panel of experts conceivably could work, but instead has millions of, of these individual things, how can we make sure that this dispersed information <clears throat> is used in a way that meets broader social goals. And Hayek's answer is prices. The price system itself will reflect that kind of social valuation. And he gives an example here. Uh, his example is 10. You could pick your own example for that. Uh, and, and so uh, Hayek asks the point, what, what if there's a, a shortage of 10 anywhere in the world? And, and so what, what's going to happen is the price is going to rise. And when the price rises, Hayek says, you will find out that people will start to do the right thing without even an order being given. When prices rise, consumers will conserve. When prices rise, producers will start adding second shifts. And you'll see more resources being devoted to uh, production. And so uh, Hayek quote, uh, quote from Hayek, he says, the whole acts as one market. Not because any of its members survey the whole field, but because their limited individual fields of vision sufficiently overlap so that through many intermediaries, the relevant information is communicated to all. And it's significant that it doesn't depend on knowing why 10 is scarce. He says it's really important. Uh, the, it, the issue is the economy of information, the, the speed the information can be transmitted, of what the social, social goals would be. Uh, 
when you think about how little you need to know to do the right thing. You just need to know the price has risen and in your own self-interest, you want to conserve if you're a consumer when prices go up and in your own self-interest, when you're a producer, you want to produce more. That's how social valuations enter into the, the production of resources is through the price system. And the price system is the amalgamation of the values of all of the market participants. It's not just to the, 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 the few. Hayek argued, if the price system would have been designed uh, as an invention by a person, it would have been heralded as one of the world's greatest achievements. But because it emerges naturally from the competitive market process, people take it for granted and think this information would be available. Uh, and with that, unfortunately, I think I'm going to hold this one over to the next lesson uh, and we'll talk about there because I'm out of time for today's lecture. Um, I just want to uh, encourage you, uh, as, as you've thought about this state of debate, we're going to, the next, next chapter, just for le the lesson for you, uh, your prep, we're going to finish this, and we're going to go through Hayek's uh, The Road to Serfdom, some of the warnings he said about socialism. Actually, the pursuit we'll see of socialism could lead, lead to other unintended consequences in, in a very negative fashion. That's a key part of the argument. And then we'll be transitioning after that to look at some of, the, in the course, some of the specific areas where socialism or socialist thinking is applied in today's world. Uh, and we'll have some examples later on in the course. So if you have any questions, I'm willing to take them. Otherwise, I will see you here next time.